So, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for our highly qualified members of the Presidium and guests who came here to, from afar to do selfless work. And that work is to come together and pave a much better road to patient-centered healthcare in its truest and deepest meaning. And with that said, I would like to begin our um, panel discussion. I have a couple questions prepared that I would like to propose, and if anybody would like to react to that and have an answer, if you can raise your hand and uh, take a microphone and answer or contribute to that question. So my question number one would be, how can we, because this has been said from many of you, um, how can we bridge the gap between the traditional and complementary medicine and the conventional healthcare to ensure patient center healthcare. If anybody would like to see how can we how can we bridge that gap between these two basically worlds? <laughs> how can we come together? And uh, also what steps can be taken to promote collaboration and communication between uh, the traditional healers, practitioners, and conventional healthcare providers. If anybody would like to address that issue. Yes, Dr. Uwe, Pat. Yes, it is um, a question. And uh, at first, the idea is that we can build the bridge in the technical way but we don't have any opportunity to build the bridge. The, the bridge has to be built by the patients. They have to ask, they have to yeah, take their freedom, their choice of, uh, of treatment, and in this way, there is a need to communicate because pa patients want to have sometimes both sides of medicine, sometimes only one side of the classical medicine, and on the other hand, the naturopathy medicine as well, only for some diseases. And this is a bridge, the patient is our bridge. And we have to listen to the patient, and we have to give the patient good arguments to say, okay, it is my choice, it is my freedom, and you have to communicate both sides together. It's my opinion, that's the right way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the patient is the key. And also, um, probably we need to educate the public so they have the knowledge of what they even should be asking for. And I also saw Mr. Razzi wanted to uh, contribute if... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Bruno Renzi. Okay. No, I I would like to take here um, an experience that I had from 2002 to 2012. Uh, we created a psychosomatic center in a public hospital in the university in Milano, that was the Hospital Sacco, in which we integrated for the first time in a public structure Ayurveda in the treatment of psychosomatics. So one way is just to start and to promote this kind of initiative in public uh, institution. And it was easy because uh, there is a part of preventive, preventive medicine that is one part of the, the Ayurveda that you can easily introduce in the treatment of, of your patient, also in public institution. And so this is a way. This is a way in which we can start and we, we, what we can promote just to introduce public in the public the structure, uh, non-conventional and traditional medicine. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, next was... Does it work? It is yeah. working. Mm -hmm. Just like to add what has already been said very rightly, 
I think in, in most countries in the world, Western countries, especially in Europe, the population is already wishing to have uh, alternative approaches other than just taking medicines and surgery. So the population is already wanting it, and yet it doesn't happen. So I think it's always a multimodality approach. Um, so we have to convince the established community, which is the modern medicine, uh, with their tools, that means scientific research, uh, to show that alternative approaches and traditional medicines, they do work and they have a scientific basis. If this happens, then we can more easily convince the established medical community to adopt uh, traditional medicines. So this is just some, the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. So basically more research and proof that it is a valid, legitimate way of healing yes, modality yes. that actually truly works. Okay, I think next was Dr. Paswati Patacharya. Thank you. This is a perfect uh, segue from what you said, because, I don't need these, uh, because modern medicine is one uh, way that we always say they are the ones in power and they are the established power. But actually, it's not evidence that convinces people. It's never evidence. There's lots of evidence out there. And for anyone that thinks there is not good um, placebo-controlled randomized clinical trials for TCIM, there are. There's lots of evidence in the data, in the published medical literature, in very good journals for acupuncture, for homeopathy, for many modalities. What we say is that it's all about BS. Now, I don't know if this will translate from English, but in English, BS is an acronym for bullshit. <laughs> but it is also an acronym for belief systems. And it's really about our belief systems. It's not that I need to see it to believe it. It's that I need to believe it before I can see it. And if you don't believe that something is possible and the only way to see evidence is through pharmacology, um, then you will never be able to see any other kind of evidence. So one of the things that I would like to propose to the answer to this question is that we look at the history of what has worked. If we read history, if we go to the people who really look at the history of science, we will see some things that maybe we were not educated in. When I was in my pharmacology training, I learned that pharmacology is the only way, the best way. And when I asked about non-pharmaceutical herbal medicines that I had seen in Tibet or in China or India, they said, that's all dirty medicine. It's not standardized. And I was taught to believe that unless it's standardized and clean and pure, it's not good for you. But pure does not mean 100% chemically one way. Pure means that which is compatible with the human body. And whether it's water or whether it's a particular herb, it's very important that we understand what is pure. So if we go back into the history of different kinds of medicine, we'll actually find patterns. So life is not a circle. Life is a spiral. And in fact, the earth doesn't move around the sun in a circle. It moves around in a spiral. And if you don't understand that, go and watch anything in physics and go and read the Surya Siddhanta of the ancient um, Indian text, and they will say that it's actually a spiral. So if you go and read history, you'll actually find there are a lot of people who are thinkers much before we have come, and that there are many, many truths about this healing and the way to actually bridge between the modern medical and the TCIM practitioners is to look at history where there's a lot of irrefutable objective truth in archaeology and astronomy and preserved elixirs like in, the, in Prague, what we find in the tunnels. If we go to history and put that in the face of the people who are conventional medical, it might help serve a bridge that these things existed before and it's time for you to open your mind that maybe you were miseducated. And I'm saying you meaning me. I was so miseducated when I learned modern medicine. There's so much stuff that doesn't work that it's time for us to put that in the face of modern medicine so they can be allowed to see, not in a punitive way that we, they are wrong, but to see that there are other ways that historically were possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, history is important, belief system, 
and education. And uh, we also, uh, I also have Mr. Verma on Zoom. And I would like to take an opportunity uh, for him to uh, contribute to these questions while um, we have a internet connection and he is he is with us. <laughs> and then I will give space to the next. So thank you very much. And I would like to share my experience. <clears throat> Before coming to Canada, I was practicing Ayurveda in Delhi in India. And I practiced there for, la for at least five, uh, 25 years. The basis of my practice was up to diagnosis, we use modern medicine. And for treatment, we are, we are using Ayurveda strategies, Ayurveda treatments, Ayurveda planning. And I successfully treated, <clears throat> I was specialized in uh, ulcerative colitis, and I successfully treated more than uh, 15,000 patients of ulcerative colitis <clears throat> who were diagnosed with colonoscopy, with uh, biopsy, with all the modern diagnostic methods. And we treated on the principles of Ayurveda, and we treated those patients who are not getting relief with the uh, conventional allopathic medicines like sulfur cellagen, mesalamide, steroids, biological drugs. They responded very well to Ayurvedic treatment. And after treatment, we sent the patient for again investigations, and they found the treatment was very effective, even the there were some changes seen in the biopsies. So combination of both modern medicine and traditional medicine is an effective way to give relief to the patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think next uh, to answer was, from what I saw him raising his hand was, OK. <laughs> Isabel, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, the, the, um, to establish this bridge, I think it's very important as well to showcase uh, the, the solution because you have many uh, amazing initiatives in the world, but they are not uh, showcased, you know, specifically sometimes by the international community because they are focusing attention on only some very specific things. For example, myself, I have discovered recently an initiative uh, in uh, not just in Switzerland, worldwide. I have discovered worldwide, you have, I am sure you, you are not aware about that, we have 40 living museums worldwide are existing. And these people uh, from voluntary base, voluntary contribution, have decided to complement, you know, the failure of some psychiatric hospital. And, uh, for example, in Switzerland, because you have quite um, high uh, universal coverage system, because that is another issue. It is, you know, uh, to complement each other, to, to, to go beyond just the practice of medicine. What does it mean? What, what is the functioning of the full health systems, you know, to allow this bridge as well? That is a, is a key question, you know. Look, here in Switzerland, it's possible to have these people, you know, complement, for example, the lack of, uh, I would say, soft approach to the patient affected by mental health. So what they are doing, they open, in fact, a place where the patient, not just from the hospital, but from, for example, from the cities or the village, have depression. They come free, free of charge because you know the assurance take in charge, you know the the, the access in this place, and they can do the uh, perform the art they want. So they are not forced to do anything. They come, and if they feel, you know, uh, it is a time for them to perform sculpture or music or painting, and, and it's very beautiful. And I, um, I would like to invite everybody to visit one day this type of place. You, uh, the, the initiative has started in in US in New York, but who is aware about that? Who is aware? And the issue it is this access to the knowledge. 
Now, it's not just the bridge. The bridge is existing already, but the people, they cannot see it, you know? Look, we, do, we have uh, one journalist with us. <laughs> and uh, where are the, for example, media, uh, positive media today, to report about uh, positive initiative uh, delivered by people, you know, decide to, 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 to amplify creativity, imagination, innovation, and not just negative thought. That is really the question mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I agree with that. And um, we have, we don't have actually any time left. <laughs> but um, I would like to still take the opportunity to hear what Nora Laubstein has to say to the yeah. question. And For me, it's interesting when you want to build a bridge, what kind of bridge you're building? What's the riversides? Who wants to build a bridge? Who is building the bridge? Who gives the money for the bridge? What uh, kind of material you use for your bridge? What's the conditions? Who should pass the bridge? Who is allowed to pass the bridge? Who will conquer the bridge? So these are the questions for me about a bridge. Not more, thank you. Unfortunately, our time for today has been already fulfilled. <laughs> there will be an opportunity to address some of these questions um, during the presentations during the next few following days. Um, but before we all leave, I'd like to gather everybody who has received an invitation via email for tonight's activity to please uh, transition to the restaurant located on the lower level. You can use the staircase. There are two staircases, one through the main hall, one through the um, hall number two, um, or an elevator. And yes. OK. <laughs> There will be a meeting with uh, Mr. Tomáš Pfeiffer. And um, for everybody else, I would like to wish everyone good night. Uh, we will meet again tomorrow when the presentations will begin at 9 a.m. Um, so we will see you then. Thank you very much. And I believe yes. Tomáš would like to speak up. <laughs> I would like to thank all the speakers uh, uh, from the Presidium of the Congress. I would like to thank all the viewers. And I, I'm looking forward to our next Congress session tomorrow, uh, when we will be able uh, to hear a lot of useful information. Uh, a bridge uh, is built from the material which is available. Sometimes it might be wooden sticks, sometimes it might be locks, and sometimes it might be metal, and sometimes it's a mere soil. Uh, but we have to use what is available, and we have to start working. We must be on the right place uh, at the right time. We must be patient. We must not to uh, expect too much, but at the same time, we must uh, hope. And therefore, I look forward to our next Congress session tomorrow.